Good morning. I'm very much touched by what Under Secretary Paula Gordinsky had to say about me. I wondering whether it was really me that she was talking about. I've been attending this victim of uh, communism memorials uh, roll call every year, but this year I'm privileged to be in an additional capacity, and I thank you all for this. When I was informed of your intention to bestow upon me the Truman Reagan Medal of Freedom, my immediate feeling was that I'm, I'm not deserving of it. First of all, just have a look at the list of the past honorees, and my contribution doesn't reach anywhere near any of these individuals and organizations. Secondly, given the nature of modern Tibetan history, it's in the DNA of each and every Tibetan to do whatever we can to oppose the misdeeds of the Chinese Communist Party towards our homeland and people. Under the leadership of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and may I say His Holiness's representative Dr. Namjil Chirduk is over here, all Tibetans are nurtured in an environment where the Tibetan struggle is part of our daily lives. In Tibet, our Tibetan brothers and sisters are not in a situation to reveal their true thinking. But those of us outside of Tibet are contributing in our respective ways to the fulfillment of His Holiness the Dalai Lama's wish. This is one of the reasons why the Tibetan issue is still being alive even after six decades of occupation under Chinese communist regime. Therefore, I've not felt for a moment that I was doing anything out of the ordinary whether during my school days, when I first began my activism, or when I was working as a professional journalist for Indian Express, or even when after I joined the Tibetan government in exile, as Ambassador Dobrinsky mentioned. After joining the International Campaign for Tibet, and my colleague Tenshin Gyatola, the new president of ICT, is here, in 1995, and in my task of supporting the work of Mr. Lodi Gary, the special envoy of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Executive Chairman of the International Campaign for Tibet Board, I've been fortunate not only to spread awareness of the Tibetan situation, but more importantly, be part of a team that worked on encouraging policy initiatives on Tibet by governments, including the United States. Today, we are proud to see that fundamental support to Tibet in the United States is not only bipartisan, but has been institutionalized through many legislations. We are hopeful that a new bipartisan and bicameral legislation promoting a resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act, which is before Congress, will become law soon so that the U.S. can ensure that the Tibetan people can have support now and in the future. Therefore, the honor that you bestow on me today is really an acknowledgement of the strength of the Tibetan people and their struggle, and I'm very grateful for it. I should point out here that I personally did not suffer any personal persecution under the communist Chinese rule. My parents were among those few Tibetans, as uh, Paula mentioned, who were able to flee to exile, carrying me when I was barely a few days old across the mountain. Nevertheless, my fellow Tibetans, both in Tibet and outside, and like them, I too have become a victim of Chinese communism in a different way. Chinese communists have deprived the entire Tibetan people of our identity and sense of belonging. Tibet is more seen as a position by the Chinese communists who prefer to call it China's Tibet, rather than Tibet being allowed to survive as a country with a living and distinct culture. On account of the Chinese policies, the survival of Tibetan culture, language, religion, way of life has been threatened. So much so that Tibetans refer to the Chinese communists as Tenda Gyamar, Red China, enemy of the faith. It might interest you to note that the medal, which is named after two presidents, if you look at their story, they came into their administration when Tibet went through significant period of its own history. 
It was during the time of President Harry S. Truman in the late 1940s when communist Chinese took over China and then began their plan for invasion of Tibet. In the initial decades of their occupation, the Chinese communists launched a policy of physical destruction of Tibet. This included killing Tibetans considered enemies and destroying Tibetan religious and cultural centers. There certainly are Tibetan victims of Chinese communism out of the 100 million people that you mentioned earlier. By your action today, you are honoring the memory of the 1.2 million Tibetans who, according to the Central Tibetan Administration in Dharamsala, have died under Chinese occupation between 1949 and 1979. This figure includes at least 430 thousand Tibetans who were killed in the fighting in the 1950s and thereafter, 340,000 who starved to death, 56,000 who were executed, 90,000 who died during the infamous struggle sessions, 170,000 who died in prison, and at least 9,000 who ended up having to commit suicide. Now, during the time of President Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, Tibetans in Tibet were able to show their resilience. During a short period then, when Tibet experienced a comparatively liberalized policy, the Tibetan people were able to reveal their continued devotion to their faith, their culture, and identity. A subsequent ruthless and far-reaching communist Chinese policy of control, eventually becoming one of assimilation made such displays impossible. However, I have no doubt that the resilience of the Tibetans in Tibet will continue to be shown in different ways. Today, you are also putting the spotlight on the 159 Tibetans who have committed self immolation in Tibet since 2009 to highlight the plight of the Tibetan people under Chinese rule. They made the highest sacrifice, giving their lives even while ensuring that others are not harmed in the process. I take this opportunity to pay my homage to the Tibetans in Tibet, who through their determination and courage, continue to stand up, stand up to the assault of the Chinese communists. In exile, His Holiness of the Dalai Lama adopted far-sighted policies aimed at preserving Tibetan identity and cultural heritage on the one hand, while working towards a peaceful resolution to the Tibetan issue on the other. He established a democratic system of governance for the Tibetans in the exile, including devolving his political authority to the elected Tibetan leadership. Despite the fact that historically Tibet was independent, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been looking for a non-violent solution, mutually satisfactory solution to Tibet that takes into consideration Chinese interests too. His Holiness the Dalai Lama escaped to India in 1959 and since been unable to return to his homeland. He'll be 88 years old this coming July. The Dalai Lama continues to be a symbol of the Tibetan nation and people. The strong bitten bond between His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan people is the primary reason why the Tibetan circle has continued to be non-violent. Tibet occupies a strategic position in Central Asia, and it's important that it does not become another flashpoint like the Middle East. It is for this reason that the international community needs to support the non-violent struggle of the Tibetan people as espoused by the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan leadership. But the world needs to be concerned about the survival of Tibet, Tibetans, not only out of sympathy for the Tibetan people. Tibetan culture, Tibetan Buddhist philosophy, science or medicine has much to contribute to the development of the world civilization. Therefore, the survival of Tibetan culture is in the interest of the international community. Also, no one, war, no one in this world desires war and violence. And at a time when we are all concerned with violent conflicts, it's imperative that peaceful movements like that of the Tibetan people receive strong support. At this point, may I say that for any political system to continue to exist, it has to be relevant and beneficial to the people. 
the Chinese Communist Party has failed the people of China. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama has said, it has to change according to the reality of the situation. The Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation has been playing an important role in reminding the international community about communism and its misuse in different parts of the world. We all see is consistent and continue to focus on the plight of those who are being persecuted by the Ch communist Ch regimes and highlighting of them in the international community is a source of strength and hope and encouragement to those communities. In Tibetan Buddhism, dedicating any positive deeds like this honor today for the common good has an important role in us spiritual practice. So may I take the opportunity to recite a short dedication prayer. I'll do that first in Tibetan and then in translation in English. So nam di thamche sikwa yi thom ne nyebe dan nam thamche ne kega na chi balap thupa yi sibe sole do dolwar sho. By this merit, may all beings attain omniscience and defeat the enemy of wrongdoing. And may, be, and may they be free from these worldly seas, waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. In conclusion, I would like to say that the people of Tibet have not lost their hope despite over six decades of communist rule, Chinese communist rule. In 1959, soon after the Chinese communists occupied Tibet, one Indian political leader by the name of Jai Prakash Narayan said this, and I quote, is Tibet lost forever? No, a thousand times no. Tibet will not die because there is no death to the human spirit. Communism will not succeed because man will not be slave forever. Thank you very much.